Hi there, this is Josh from Literary Gladiators, and today I am here to begin a series of top 10 lists. Back in 2020, I kicked off the year with uh, a countdown of my 10 favorite novels of all time. And I wanted to create lists for short stories, poems, and plays as well. And so here is going to be my top 10 list counting down uh, to number one uh, of my uh, 10 favorite short stories of all time. And I would like to do this every 10 years, uh, and the list would be subject to change based off of my mood, uh, my responses to particular short stories at hand, and just the idea of uh, what I read. Uh, so there's a lot to take into account. Uh, but let's get started into counting down my 10 favorite uh, short stories of all time that I have ever read. Uh, number 10 on this list is Micromegas by Voltaire. I read this for a season five discussion of Literary Gladiators. And I read it with, through this uh, great French short stories collection, which I like a lot more than uh, those that have rated it on Goodreads. Uh, but what really caught my attention is the way that we see ourselves and the way that uh, the universe would probably see us. Because the idea of uh, civi uh, citizens of other planets, uh, namely Jupiter and Saturn, coming to Earth and pretty much realizing how small it is to the point that they can uh, maneuver it, m maneuver the largest objects right on one finger. And it would probably take a it would take a microscope for them to really examine uh, what we would see as our average pieces of land. Uh, but I think it's very I think Avaltar was very uh, clever and uh, thought provoking as far as seeing the world around him is concerned and. I, uh, the, the fact that he uh, reminds us of how meaningless we are uh, at, at, uh, among the greater perspective is quite an interesting and an interesting concept and I, I really admired the way that this was written. One of the most thought-provoking minds as far as literature is concerned uh, in my mind is Virginia Woolf. And I first read a work of hers in British Literature 2 when we went over the mark on the wall. And we did an assignment where we had to stare at an object and then write down everything we were thinking. And that didn't necessarily have to pertain to the object at hand. Uh, because we are bound to be thinking about other things, just as she was in that piece. But the one that really sticks out to me is another short story of hers called Kew Gardens. Here is a collection of the complete shorter fiction of Virginia Woolf. And you can find uh, Kew Gardens within this collection. The interesting thing about this piece is that it takes the perspective of... It tells the story from the point of view of the garden itself. And those that are within the background, uh, the everyday people, uh, they, they are just supporting uh, what's going on within the perspective of a day in the life of the garden. And the story that really sticks out is that of the snail. And the snail's very own endeavor within uh, the garden. It just goes to show you a lot has to do with perspective and we think a lot about the perspective of people but 
what we don't think about all of the time is the perspective of every living being and the way that they see things, the way that the non-human world sees things. And I was really, uh, I really got a lot out of discussing Kew Gardens back in season seven of Literary Gladiators. Number eight on this list is a more contemporary piece, and uh, that is The Art of Losing by Yoon Choi. Uh, it was featured in the Best American Short Stories of 2018, uh, but it originally made its appearance in the New England Review. And we discussed it on our channel back in Season 10. The Art of Losing is such a heartbreaking piece because it surrounds an older man who is uh, developing uh, Alzheimer's or, and he's really beginning to, uh, he, he's beginning to worsen. He's no longer, he was, he's no longer able to take part in the church uh, music functions where he, he used to perform. Uh, but uh, that is not going well, uh, and he's living with his he's living with his wife who looks after him, and uh, within this piece, for a not so long period of time, uh, he's assigned to look after his grandson, and uh, we get his point of view and the being put in a situation where he really needs to look after the well-being of his grandson and it's just very heartbreaking to see that somebody uh, is deteriorating but yet still knows that he needs to look after and care for uh, somebody that needs to be cared for and looked after. In, uh, in this case, it's his grandson and uh, just how lost he is and but yet how compassionate he can still be. And I think that this is definitely a short story that would resonate with anybody that knows somebody who is getting up there in years, be it a, a parent, a grandparent, a great-grandparent, uh, or an, just any old elderly relative or elderly family member, or someone that they care for that is elderly and uh, dealing with a uh, decline, uh, in this case particularly uh, one pertaining to a mental health decline. Number seven on my list is my favorite Shirley Jackson short story and probably my favorite Shirley Jackson work that I've read thus far. And that work is Charles. Uh, I came across it once again in 75 Short Masterpieces, which is something that really ignited my enthusiasm for literature. Uh, I f first put together the, liter the Literature Club during my uh, stay at college. Uh, I picked this up and made my way through this collection. Uh, I first read Charles back in 8th grade, though, uh, and it pertains to uh, Lori coming home from school constantly saying that this fellow student of his, Charles, constantly causes trouble in his class. Uh, but the twist really, I think the twist is something that you could see forthright, uh, but 
the nature of the work has to do with how can the parents be so oblivious to everything going on. And I just think the way that Shirley Jackson executed this, she did it with such great humor, and it was brilliant. I really enjoyed the way that this, uh, this work flowed, and I always see something different, uh, but something so valuable every time I read the story over. Number six on my list is probably one of the most brilliant contemporary short stories of today. And that is The Semplica Girl Diaries by George Saunders, uh, which appeared in 10th of December and originally made an appearance in The New Yorker. Uh, the Semplica Girl Diaries really does a lot to explore the uh, what people in society value. Uh, the great sense of materialism and what exactly do they need in order to not just feel rich, but uh, display to everybody in the world that they are rich and filled with money. And the idea that it takes the uh, it takes the statement of morality into account. This short story was so filled with uh, thoughts that would provoke discussion that doing an individual video about it was not enough. I had to also discuss it uh, during a season 8 discussion on our channel and there was a lot to cover as far as uh, what we value and what we can and what we can what we can afford is concerned and whether or not that makes us any better of people and uh, the answer to that is it, uh, it being able uh, having all of the money in the world and all of the material to flaunt it does not make us better people that's some uh, the quality of character is not judged by the quality of money never the quality of character is measured by the quality of character number five on my list is a tie because i could not make a decision as to what my favorite ray bradbury short story was so I'm going to pick two for this one. Uh, just like in my best uh, novels of all time, I, I had a three-way tie between what my favorite Stephen King books were. But here is my collection of uh, Ray Bradbury stories. Uh, these are 100 of his most celebrated tales. Uh, the two stories that, re that make an appearance on this list are... A Sound of Thunder and The Pedestrian. A Sound of Thunder really brings into question what would happen if you went back into time and changed one little thing. And would it really be beneficial? In The Pedestrian, the fact that someone looking to take a walk in the year 2053 is met with great disdain and ultimately tyrannical whiplash. Ray Bradbury was brilliant as far as the speculative is concerned and bringing up the what-ifs in our very own lives and these are things that could these things are haunting but the most haunting part is that if we take a direction that calls for us to surrender our freedoms, then we can end up in circumstances such as we see in the pedestrian, where taking a harmless walk on an evening 
leads to uh, a criminal act. Uh, but I think that uh, I actually I read The Sound of Thunder when I was doing my research paper on Bradbury during my junior year, and we went over the pedestrian. Come to think of it, it was during middle school. It was one of the short stories that was featured. Uh, and I thought it was amazing then, and then I realized, and then I learned that Ray Bradbury wrote it, and it only makes him even more amazing. Uh, but I would like to read many more of Ray Bradbury's short stories, and perhaps something will pop up uh, that uh, takes over as a favorite, but I think these two uh, really stand their ground. Number four on my list is the best short story in this collection, and I think we need to see more of it in anthologies, uh, and we need to see more uh, evaluation. I think that people in school should be reading it more, and that is The Lottery Ticket by Ventura Garcia Calderon, and it really says a lot about what uh, what people value and what the general population of the majority background within a country may think. And when you get somebody within that country that's mistreated because they are different or they are a, mini a minority, and how he sticks it to them when he ends up winning a prize at the function at hand within the story. I thought, I just, I could not help but crack a smile when I saw uh, the direction that this took. Number three on my list is probably my favorite Langston Hughes work, and probably one of his probably one of the works that has the strongest message, and that is Thank You, Ma'am. Uh, I first read Thank You, Ma'am in seventh grade, and it really brings about the... Uh, it really brings about the actions of a woman, uh, and how she responds to a teenage boy uh, stealing her pocketbook. And the fact that she's going to do something. Uh, Miss Luella Bates Washington Jones. Uh, how she... How she decides to respond to the attempt of someone stealing her pocketbook and how she does something that he, how she, she says that he'll never forget it and he most certainly never does forget it. And I think that the way that she handles it is perfect because she could have easily have done, she, she could have easily either engaged in a physically uh, a physically painful act or she could have inflicted physical pain or she could have sent him off with law enforcement but she did something even stronger in order to uh, send a message to uh, the young the uh, the young teenage boy and I remember that Cal and I were debating his age. I thought he was more of a teenager of maybe 15 or 16. Uh, but Kel thought that he was younger, like 10 or 11. But I think what matters most is you get more... 
when you uh, you get more when you when you engage in an act of kindness and you solve problems with kindness to the point that they will not forget your act of kindness. Number two on my list is The Telltale Heart by Edgar Allan Poe. I first read this in seventh grade, and it is the work that really got me into examining literature a bit more keenly. I re I, Edgar Allan Poe is probably the first fiction writer that I really enjoyed as an adult reader, but more so the fact that I may have read kids' books when I was younger, but I think that this path to my... this road of me enjoying fiction starts with Edgar Allan Poe, and in particular reading The Telltale Heart. I just thought that the story itself was very well written as far as uh, being told from the perspective of a madman and the whole uh, complexity that did they actually hear something or was all of this taking place in the mind of the speaker in this piece? And it was just very... It was also very uh, horrific in so many ways. Uh, it really, it really set up what you would want in a work of horror fiction. I thought I think that this is this is the this is Edgar Allan Poe at his best, and I remember one of my history instructors, uh, he, he pretty much said that this is the ultimate Edgar Allan Poe piece. Uh, even though it is, uh, it's all a matter of opinion, but to me, I would say the Telltale Heart is the uh, ultimate uh, work as far as, as far as Edgar Allan Poe is concerned. Uh, and that's prose pieces. And now to answer the question of what is my favorite short story of all time. My favorite short story of all time is one that sticks with me and I continue to think about to this day. I would personally say it is one of the strongest short stories of all time. And one that does wonders when it comes to accomplishing the message that it sets out to state. My favorite short story of all time is The Monkey's Paw by W.W. W. Jacobs, which, among other uh, anthologies, can be found in this uh, Demons anthology that was edited by John Skip. Uh, the Monkey's Paw really takes the three wishes idea and pretty much solidifies what it means to be careful what you wish for. And this family that, the white family that is, uh, be, that is doing relatively well, uh, they have what they they, they have enough to be satisfied, but uh, they this monkey's paw demonstrates that they want more, and they end up in a worse situation. Probably the strongest part pertains to the second wish, because as far as the first wish is the... Uh, you have Mr. and Mrs. White, and you have their son, Herbert. Uh, for the first wish, Herbert wishes for X amount of money. The money ends up coming out of his... The money ends up coming out of grievances when he dies in a factory accident. 
The second wish, Mrs. White obviously wishes for him to come back. Probably the eeriest part, but not in a gra not in a graphic way, is the idea of what is what what is on the other side of that door, because she locks all of the, she unlocks all of the safety locks. She has so many of them uh, that. Uh, uh, while she's doing that, uh, there's a constant knock, 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 knock. And by the time she unlock, by the time she's just about ready to open the door, Mr. White finds the paw and wishes Herbert dead and at rest. So, what exactly is at the other side of that door is something that we never find out. And to this day, I still think about that. I read it during sophomore year of high school. We discussed it on our channel in season eight. So I've been able to revisit the work. And I have my... I have possibilities as to what could be at the other side of that door. But they don't matter. What matters is nobody can play with fate. That's what matters within this piece. And that's what W.W. W. Jacobs is trying to get at. It's unfortunate that he was not able to uh, extend on his career. Uh, he, this, was, this is pretty much his one-hit wonder. Uh, but... I want to thank you for watching this video, and I highly encourage you to read these short stories for yourself, because I definitely think that you will get something out of them. These are my solid recommendations, if there are any, for short stories that you should definitely read at some point in time. And it is definitely worth searching for them, because there's works like The Lottery Ticket, and even Thank You, Ma'am, that... I don't see around as much, but definitely are worth finding and definitely are worth reading. If you like what you see on our channel, please subscribe. Uh, please give the video a good old like. And I definitely would like to continue the conversation about this with you in the comments. And if you really, really like what you see, please support our channel on Patreon, for the money that we make will allow us to provide you, the viewer, with even more great content. Be sure to join us next time, and for now, keep reading.